Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Steve DiGiorgio, basis of Death DTA. Hello to everyone watching. You're watching Impact Channel. Hey guys, we are here with Steve DiGiorgio himself. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Excellent. In a few words, how would you describe Chuck's legacy? In a few words? Well, that's not easy. Chuck's legacy? In a very few words, we're still here. Mm -hmm. We're still playing his music. People are still buying tickets and enjoying a night of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good 20 years, almost. After the end of death was about 18 years ago since the last mm -hmm. death, and it's probably stronger than it was when Chuck was alive. Mm -hmm. You know, so his legacy speaks for itself. It's the logo is like an icon for death metal. The music is like the soundtrack for death metal, mm -hmm. and he's inspired musicians, songwriters, you know, people that find meaning in the lyrics. You know, the legacy speaks for itself. It's huge, and and here we are, still playing his songs. You know, and people still like to watch and, and enjoy the the music. So it's it's amazing to watch it because I was part of it when when the band was working and you know trying to build up, and it was like any normal band back then. You know, mm -hmm. some shows were good, some were almost empty, and you know, you had to, you know, fight for your space, and it was like a normal band. But after his death, you know, 15 years after his death, it's it's bigger than it was when he was around. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good legacy. Mm -hmm. What's your kindest memory of Chuck? Oh, well, you know, I met him when we were about 17, 18 years old, and I worked with him off and on through the whole history of the band, and I was... Uh, a member of the final lineup when he when he died you know the control denied lineup so I mean like I said I'd known him since we were teenagers all the way up until he died so I have tons of memories we were we were friends outside of the music you know we would do stuff together barbecues and hiking and in Florida we'd go canoeing stuff like that so I mean what you know what does one have memories of their friend it's a million memories so mm -hmm. I mean he was he was a good buddy of mine we got along great there are some rumors out there about the releasing of the Contra Denied album the second Contra Denied album do you have any news on that it's not really rumors because to me rumor is like like people spreading you know gossip mm -hmm. we were honestly trying to release that album and the plan right right when he died the, the whole lineup was at his funeral and we had a meeting there and we said we're gonna do this mm -hmm. we're gonna finish it we're gonna put it out it's what he wanted but man we ran into so many problems it was never just one problem it was just a combination of there was you know the the legal issues with the company the 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 digital machine that he used was uh, kept from the band for a while and then when it was finally you know given to the band it was corrupted so then we had to extract the information through some digital code and convert it and then right, it's one thing after another you know it's it's been so long since that music has been played and we have to relearn it and but I think the biggest issue is the the uh, the technology part of it right. it's it seems that it's not easy to complete this mm -hmm. because we're all trying everybody's trying Richard did a great job getting some of the digital material extracted Shannon's always done a good job holding it down and trying to be the the foundation of finishing this project but even so it just seems like there's too much in the way for it to come out which is sad because you know we've heard the songs I have the songs you know on my iPod and, and the cassettes that Chuck sent me back in those days and the songs are great and it sucks because that's all we have we don't have the final version so I don't know no good news man but what can I say I'm, it's out of my control 
And who will be the singer for the second one, if it will be ever released? Tim, I'm around. Same, yeah, it'll be Tim. The same lineup as the exact same lineup as, and that's another thing that's sad. Chuck has never had back-to-back -back lineups, and this was the first time it was going to be done. And it's like a curse or something, you know, because we we still have the same lineup for the second, you know, first control denied, the second control denied, but now we run into a different force of nature. So mm. I don't know. No yeah. good news, sorry. Mm. If you had a chance to go on tour with Contra Denied Songs, would you do that? Uh, I mean, it's easy to ask me because I'm here in Hungary on tour, but some of the other guys have different lives, mm -hmm. and I don't think everyone is available to do that. So, in you know, hypothetically, yeah, it would be great, of course, mm -hmm. because I love those guys, but, you know, f we were lucky to have found Max through through Cynic mm -hmm. to make this sound possible. But you know, once again, if we put Control Denied together as a live band, we'd have to replace Chuck again, and then it just is. You know, this is this is easier because Death built up you know a long history. But with Control Denied, I think I don't know. I don't think we want to replace Chuck for another <laughs> thing. It's just. You know, I don't think it will happen. I know what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about you. <clears throat> Are you working on a new material at the moment? Well, I'm working on some new material with Testament. Mm. There's a new album coming right around the corner, and we have new Testament songs. But if you're asking about my own material, no, I haven't had time. Mm. I've been playing everybody else's songs for a long time. Mm. And who is on your bucket list to work with? Wow, that's a good one. You know, we have a there's a project going on out of Norway with musicians I've worked with before in different groups in uh, from Vintersorg and uh, Scariot. These uh, some friends of mine. Um, most of them have been in Spiral Architect or Manitou, mm -hmm. and we have a nice project that's coming up. And uh, actually, I'm the last one to do my part because of so much touring. So mm -hmm. when I get up there and finish that, that's that's going to be a great album coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to just put a little info out there, nothing official, but I'm looking forward to that. And it's not necessarily a bucket list, but it is next on the list. Mm -hmm. So look look for that one. By the way, Stefan mentioned you that he, you are on the on his bucket list to work with. Do you like Obscura? Yeah, they. You know, I toured with them about five years ago. Mm -hmm. I replaced Yorun for a Japanese tour. Mm -hmm. So well, there's a big connection. Mm -hmm. You know, I played in Obscura. Stefan's worked and played in DTA. You know, we always keep in contact. You know, and I've I've recorded with Christian Munzner and Hannes Grossman, who used to be in Obscura. So it's a big uh, kind of uh, almost like a family. Mm -hmm. So I think the only thing left is for me and Stefan to mm -hmm. uh, collaborate. So, how did you become a music fan? Who inspired you in the beginning? Uh, a music fan. <laughs> I, it's one of those things that was with me at such a young age. I don't remember a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. I think I just had an environment that was kind of musical. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd go through, you know, as I'm a little kid, you listen to little kid stuff. And mostly what, you know, my mom's record collection was. Well, almost everything except for Elvis Presley, I do. <laughs> but she listened to a lot of jazz, fusion, and different kind of folk music. And I got, I grew from that into my own taste. But it's just something that's been with me my whole life. I don't, you know, I don't really remember making a choice for it. It's always been with me. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a bigger music fan than uh, what do you say, uh, a musician? Mm -hmm. Like I I enjoy to listen to music and go to concerts even more than I do it. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, I, I'm one of those musicians that doesn't like to listen to the albums I've recorded. Like there's some people that only listen to what they've recorded. I can't stand it. I mm -hmm. go listen to new stuff and find other you know more interesting music mm -hmm. from for myself. Yeah. But. Ah, so always a music fan, to answer short, even though it was long. <laughs> what was the first album you bought? Oh. That's another difficult one. I don't know if it was the first album, but I remember, I think it was 1978. I was just, just old enough to where my mom let me walk to the mall, which was not too far, but I was too young to go places normally. Mm -hmm. 
and I had a five dollar bill mm-hmm. and I went to the record store and I'm looking for something and I love Black Sabbath and it's, it said new album and it looked strange because the members were on the cover wearing like pajamas or something <laughs> and I said this looks strange but it's the new one so I want to hear it and it was four dollars and ninety eight cents and I was a smart kid I knew I could afford it so I put it up on the counter and I put my five dollar bill on there and the guy looks at me and says where's the rest I said no that's that's enough and he goes well there's tax it was a little more than five dollars and I got so sad I was like ah and he laughed and he said I'll pay your tax, kid. He took the five dollars, and I walked home with the album and put it on. And I was like, "Yeah, it was cool." So it was a triumph for me, and and I knew, and I always went back to that guy. Even he worked there so long that I would give him, you know, personal demos, or sometimes I would get an advance from a record company. I'd always give it to him. Always repay the guy for paying that, like five or six cents tax mm-hmm. on that album for me. I always told him, I said, you let me have that Sabbath album when I couldn't afford it. Even though it was just a few cents short, I said, but I always remember that. So I always gave him stuff and I just watched him grow old and I got big and we stayed in good touch because of that. So it was always a good good contact mm-hmm. into the music world for me, that guy. <laughs> so I, I remember though. that. So I bought Sabotage on the release day mm-hmm. with my own money, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what was your first concert as a fan and as a musician? Well, see, then again, my mom brought me to concerts when I was so young. I would go see, like, symphony orchestras mm-hmm. that would play, like, you know, the music from Fantasia. Or we'd go to an outdoor amphitheater, and it would be, like, the Oakland Symphony Orchestra with laser light show. You know, I was big in the 70s. Mm-hmm. You know, and then, then we would go to, like, all the current like fusion music like I seen Chuck Mangione, Herb Alpert, Hugh Masekela, Spyro Gyra, uh, you know stuff like this like the cool you know when fusion started just crossing into the radio mm-hmm. you know like the catchy instrumental hits that were just going into mainstream we would go to these concerts when I was young so I was always exposed and and playing in band class in school we would have our own concerts mm-hmm. so it just seemed like an environment I was always used to playing them as a kid and going um, I guess on my own like when I finally went with my friends and stuff some of the earlier concerts were like Rush uh, Jethro Tull uh, we saw the first Dio show ever Wow um, we didn't know at the time but when we look back and I actually got to meet Ronnie James Dio and I told him we went to that particular show and it was actually in my hometown which never has concerts it was out in the countryside in a barn mm-hmm. and we told him we went to that and he told us he said that is a very important show for me and we're looking at him like yeah right you probably tell all your fans that and he said no that was the first Dio show ever that was the opening show of the Holy Diver tour and we we're like wow cool we were part of history I mean that was, you know in the crowd but you know so that was probably 83 I think something like that and uh, yeah shows like that like Iron Maiden I think we even went to uh, pretenders or something just because mm-hmm. we could you know uh, saw Black Sabbath born again yeah Jethro Tull broadsword and the beast rush we went to, we missed the signals tour but I think the next tour was grace under pressure So stuff like that, I guess, early 80s, mm-hmm. probably when we were old enough to go on our own. Mm-hmm. So there you go. <laughs> Never a short answer, huh? <laughs> What do you like to do when you're not busy with your projects? I like to be outside. Mm-hmm. If it's a nice hike in the mountains or, you know, getting on a boat in the river, I like to do that. But I think most of the outdoor stuff I do is... Uh, I have like a, a big yard, like a huge garden behind my house, and we have cats and dogs and chickens, and and me and my wife own horses and stuff. So I mean, it's it's a lot of work with with all the plants, and and California is very dry and hot, so I work a lot with the irrigation, you know, the sprinklers and stuff to keep everything alive. And yeah, a lot of work with the animals, and you know, I'm always barefoot walking through the dirt and getting sunburned and. And at night, have a nice cocktail and watch space go by, watch the stars and get my telescope and watch, you know, you know, 
galactic events and stuff like that. Do you have a favorite star, planet, or constellation? Well, because of the summer uh, configuration, it seems like the swan is always looking down at me. It's called mm -hmm. Cygnus in English, or or whatever language we call it, Cygnus. Mm -hmm. It's a the constellation is drawn as a swan, mm -hmm. and I'll find myself outside, you know, trying to go to sleep, drinking. And I always look up, and that damn swan's always following me around, looking down at me. So I always talk to the swan in the sky. That's probably that's a good one. And on clear nights to the north, uh, you can see the Andromeda galaxy. It's pretty fun. I have giant Giant binoculars mm -hmm. out there like a like a space nerd cool. taking pictures like yeah like eclipses and always looking for comets it's just mm -hmm. you know because the long clear warm nights in California I mean it's you go outside and the first thing you do is look up like whoa you know it's it's an amazing sky so I find myself always looking for something but I'm not into the whole alien mm -hmm. weird thing I just look at the natural events mm -hmm. I look at what my eyes can see that's all Maybe they're there, maybe they're not, but hopefully I find them. If you could pick the bass players for a Di Giorgio tribute album, who do you want to hear on that? You know, hopefully it's a tribute that I'm part of and not when I'm dead, because I've been planning in my imagination to do a bass collaboration, and I've been working on a long list. Mm -hmm. There's an amazing batch of young bass players out there now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, holy crap, where do I start? I wish I could refer to my notes because I could ramble off a big list, but right now I seem to be at a loss. Um, Jeroen Tesling, who used to play for Obscura, is amazing to me. Uh, oh, God, put me on the spot. I'm telling you, I have a big list. Uh, Linus is great for Obscura. Um, Aaron McSporin, if that's how you pronounce it, he's a British bass player, plays in many projects. You might have heard of him from a death metal band called Deep Profundus. Okay. Killer chops. Uh, the bass player Nick Zangelis from uh, Cephalic Carnage and also Job for a Cowboy. Chops on that guy, just. And uh, I think it's Ryan Martini or something. Uh, he's famous for Mudvayne. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, killer. Um, uh, I'm leaving out so many. This sucks. They'll come to me after the interview, I swear. <laughs> Your website has a really cool Nordic design. Could you please tell us about that interest? Well, it's... I'll start by saying it's my heritage. My mother is... Well, my mother's parents are from Norway. Mm -hmm. My mom... Well... Anyway, my great-grandparents, for sure, came from Norway. Mm -hmm. I think my great my grandparents were born in USA. My mother was born in USA, but it's all 100% Norwegian bloodline. Okay. My father's Italian, that's where I get my name. Mm -hmm. I know you didn't think it was Chinese, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but Americans, a, a lot of them who actually care about where they come from, it's always a search for the identity. Mm -hmm. Because Americans always say, you know, what's your nationality? You know, and it's always a mix. You, you know, I'm, I'm compared to a lot of American people, I'm 50-50, and that's pretty close to pure mm -hmm. for especially European immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know, but everyone's such a big mix of everything, and everybody likes to talk about, you know, what they are. And it's always, a, you know, a lot of DNA tests, a lot of... Uh, a lot of search for the heritage goes on there. It's it's a big thing because America has a young history and almost no culture or tradition mm -hmm. from the old times. It's kind of a new budding culture. We better hurry. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I just, being close to that side of my family and learning a lot about, you know, there's people, my, my mom's older brother, my uncle, has done an amazing job with this huge family tree. Mm -hmm. And we can trace our family lineage back hundreds of years. So I like to just stay in touch with this this Norse vibe. And, and it looks cool. I mean, it's it's part of who I am, and it also fucking looks cool. So It is. Yeah. Okay, so we need to finish. Do you have any message to your fans? Well, if you're out there, thanks for the attention. Thank you for the time. Always appreciate it. And every time we come through, good to see you guys out here when we play. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.